What's up, Kansas City? This is the 12th time we've tried to start this intro because we can't stop making each other laugh. I'm Roxy. And I'm still laughing. <laughs> What's up, Kansas City? I'm Corey. And I'm aboard the struggle bus, Roxy. And we're Drink KC. <laughs> and today we're here talking to you about Lifted Spirits Distillery in the Crossroads Arts District. So Lifted Spirits is all about uh, transparency. They're very much all about talking about their recipes, how they do business, how they make their stuff. And uh, they're also a little bit of mad scientists, I would say. Yeah, I feel like you have to be to get into distilling. It's probably true. But they gave us a little peek behind the curtain to see their their science at work. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. So we did a tour there with their COO, Derek. And uh, we got to see the space, which we have been in once before, but we got to explore it a lot more. Yeah, and he gave us the actual history of it, which we hadn't known. Yeah, so across from the building, there used to be a bakery. So back in the day, you had to deliver your bread via horse, because, you know, before cars. So the building that lifted spirits in was the stable. So it's got all of this stuff for when where they would keep the hay on the second floor. Uh, and then some some false floors that you would pull the hay down to lead to the horses on the first floor. It's got a lot of the uh, original brick, the original joicing and wood. And it feels like a very well kept, very rustic space. And it's a really unique place. Mm -hmm. And I think it benefits a lot from that. So on the second floor where the hayloft was is now an event space. So you can do baby showers and, you know, like wedding receptions and stuff up there. And on the first floor, they've got their tasting room and their manufacturing area, which is where we got to hang out for a lot of our tour and learn a ton of neat science about distilling that some of which we knew and then some of which I had yeah. no idea about. Yeah, we got to go a little more inside baseball on distilling. And the first space we got to look at was the where they actually do their distilling. And the first thing we got to actually see was the, the mash tank, which they named Hulk Mash. It's Hulk because Hulk Mash. I love that he was like slightly, he seemed slightly embarrassed by that. I was like, that's awesome. He's like, you don't understand how dorky we are. That's hilarious. He had to gauge us as a group to be like, all right, is this going to go over well as a joke? Or are they going to look at me like I'm crazy? Which we thought was funny. So we thought it was funny. awesome. So then we got to see the stills where they make everything. They've got three stills and they've named two of them. So I guess the third one's name is still up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Stella is their big still. Jill, which is their little still. Jill the little still. And then they have a baby brother still that has not been named yet. And then in a lot of distilleries, everything's kind of, you know, nailed to the floor. It's very much like here's where this lives. Because they're in such a small space, it's a pretty small building. Everything back there is movable. So they can move stuff around as they do different kinds of uh, production. Yeah. They also said that that's an advantage, though, because they want to change and evolve of what they're doing and always be doing something different. And that also helps them do that. They also have their tasting library back there, which is their science room. Basically, they're always experimenting, trying new flavors. The other thing about the tour that I thought was interesting to see, at least, was that they were about to do a bottling run. And their bottling run was, like, super pared down, like, in-house. Just everybody kind of chips in. And they have, like, a four spout, so they can only fill four bottles at a time, and assembly line it down to the next person who puts the cork in and the next person seals it and the next person labels it. So that was really cool. To give a little bit of history, uh, Michael Stuckey is the founder slash master distiller. So like as the tale is old as time story goes, he started with home distilling and then opened the distillery four years ago. What I found interesting, he started out with distilling absinthe, which is who starts there? Who starts there? I mean, it's like somebody being like, I'm going to make beer. I'm going to start with making sours. So we were like, why? <laughs> I mean, but apparently it's he had or found or bought or something a bunch of old French distilling manuals. So to go into that, their absinthe or their it's called their absinthe vert is the first ever distilled in Kansas City. If you don't know what absinthe is, which you may not because up until kind of recently it was actually illegal in the U.S. 2008. 2008. Less than 15 years ago it was illegal to manufacture this product. That's so weird to me. So it is an anisette spirit, which 
means that basically like it tastes like licorice. It's a licorice, anise, fennel flavored spirit, and it has wormwood in it. And theirs is 136 proof. Uh, and they say that you really need to keep it at that proof to keep the suspension of the botanicals in it. Like if it's in too much water as opposed to alcohol, then the botanicals like... It'll settle out. It'll settle out. Yeah, it'll start looking like salad dressing. Right. So a little bit of the history of this. I didn't know this. I'm fascinated by the history of alcohol. So in the 1870s, wine was, you know, it was a big thing. But uh, this aphid called phylloxera took out estimates between like two thirds and 90% of all the vineyards in Europe. Like it just demolished like all the vineyards in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so absinthe came in as sort of this replacement for wine. It like filled that gap, which I find weird because it's not at all like wine to me, but. <laughs> well, maybe that was just part of the absinthe marketing at the time. It, it was just like, do you want to be a fancy lad like wine drinkers would be? Right. Well, have and, absinthe. And it became this huge cultural thing in 19th century Paris. So, like, all the people that were there at that time, if you've ever seen Moulin Rouge, I don't think you have. I have many, many times. <laughs> You know, the whole absinthe thing is was a huge thing in the culture there with Picasso, Dali, F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs> so and, yeah, it was an artist thing. It, it was yes. said to unlock their brain and, and let their creativity flow. So it was said that the wormwood in it would make you hallucinate. Absinthe is a very green drink, and so you would supposedly see this green fairy, and it would, like, inspire you. Really, what it was is probably not anything to do with the wormwood or, like, some kind of psychedelic hallucinogenic thing. It's just really high alcohol content, and people were probably just getting drunk out of their minds. Yeah, so this prompted us to go on this whole, like, history lesson, because... It's only been legal to make it here for the last, you know, 13, 14 years. A lot of it seems to be sort of a propaganda push from winemakers after the wine started coming back, saying that it's toxic for you and, and it causes hallucinations. And, and there was a couple of like crimes that were committed and that was kind of the key point they honed in on. When all of the symptoms of things that people say they have when they drink absinthe are just the symptoms of alcohol poisoning. Yeah. So it was just that it's a very drinkable, very high alcohol content drink. So it was easy to say, oh, it's absinthe, when really it's just any liquor. It's just happened to be very strong. The whole propaganda thing really made me think of like the AC versus DC thing of like Edison versus Tesla. Tesla. So anyway, I think absinthe might make a resurgence, especially with like the popularity of things like Jaeger. So now that we've talked about its history, how is absinthe actually made? So absinthe, like gin, you start with a neutral spirit, which is just basically a distilled spirit that doesn't really have any flavor or anything to it yet. And you soak the botanicals, which include wormwood, anise, and fennel seed, in this neutral spirit overnight. And at this point, it's called perfume gin or white absinthe. And then after the second maceration, they do a four hour slow temperature increase and then strain out the solids. And you're left with this super green spirit. Yeah, it's a super vibrant green when it's fresh. And then it actually gets like a brownish green as, as it gets older because there's chlorophyll still in the spirit after the maceration process. And as the chlorophyll becomes oxidized, it starts to turn brown like plants would. And that's actually a sign of good absinthe. Don't think that your absinthe is dying and it's going bad. Yeah, apparently a lot of people will be like, oh, my absinthe's bad because it's kind of brown. It's like, no, that means you actually bought good absinthe because it's not just green because of food dye. Yeah. So now that we've talked about their absinthe, which is super unique, it's the first one in Kansas City, gin is kind of similar to absinthe a little bit in that it's kind of this botanical spirit. It's made in a similar way. Yeah. So, Corey, why don't you tell us about their gins, since so, you really, really like their gins. I do. Um, they have two different gins. Uh, one of them, I would say, is for total non-gin drinkers, but I would say both of them are very good if, if you want to try good gin. So the only ingredient rule for gin is that it has to have juniper in it. Which, if you don't know, is kind of that pine tree-ish flavor. 
that you get from Jin. Yeah, and beyond that, it just has to be 80 proof or higher. So their Bright Gin is a vapor distilled gin that has 11 botanicals in it. And when I drank it, I didn't think it was a gin because it's very orangey, citrusy. I don't think that there's practically no juniper in it. There's a very small amount of that pine sort of minty feeling you get from most gins. It's it's very bright. It's very summery. Yeah, and I I would say that's a really good gin for people like you that aren't super gin drinkers that get put off by the juniper taste. Yeah. And I was fascinated by the vapor distillation part. Yeah, so the botanicals that they use in vapor distillation sit in sort of a basket. And when you're doing your distillation, which is a, if you don't know, it's a fancy word for boiling. You're boiling the alcohol out. The vapor from the alcohol goes up, goes into a cooling cylinder, gets cooled into alcohol. That's distillation at a very broad level. Vapor distillation is grabbing those flavors as the alcohol vapor. So it goes up whatever botanical they want to put in there. It collects on that botanical and then it vaporizes again almost immediately And it pulls some of the oil out of it, which is where it gets its flavor. They also have their bold gin, which is kind of their more standard, junipery, strong gin flavor gin. Which is still very good. Yeah, I was surprised at how much I liked it because I'm not usually a big fan of the pine tree-ish kind of gins, but it was really good. It was really well balanced. Yeah. So they soak 15 of the 17 botanicals in the neutral spirit for 18 hours prior to distilling it. And then while distilling it, they hang two more botanicals in a vapor basket for more of that vapor distillation to get more flavor into it. And the distillation process takes about 10 more hours. So it's quite the investment. That's a long couple of days. So they also have a barrel-aged gin. This is their second version of their barrel-aged gin, I believe. And this one was aged in their wheat whiskey barrels as well as Nicaraguan rum barrels. And I was amazed at how much like coconut came through on that. It was like a tropical gin, which is not ever something I would have thought could exist. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It picked up a ton of tropical flavor and it was really good. So speaking of their wheat whiskey, it is 100% wheat. Uh, Most of the time when you have whiskey, there's some corn, there's rye. So this is really unique in that it is 100% wheat. Even though it is a whiskey, it's it's unlike any whiskey I ever had because I'd only had rye and bourbon, and this whiskey was like way different. It's it's still a little sweet, but it's a really unique flavor. It's got a honey and a butterscotch and a little bit of spice. For those of you that, that don't know, because uh, I didn't know this until recently, it takes so long to offer whiskey because. I mean, you make it, but then it's got to age for several years. So most of the places that offer whiskey, like right when they open, they're sourcing that whiskey from somewhere else. And they're either just rebranding it or they're mixing it in some way, you know, doing a blend. But they really didn't want to source it. They wanted to make it all in-house. And uh, one thing that we talked about during the tour. So for those who are interested in age statements, it's a it's a two-year uh, aged in white oak. But it kind of got us on the on the spur of the discussion of age statements can be misleading. The age statement alone can't tell the whole story. Basically, what happens when you age a whiskey over time is it's it changes how much of that whiskey is evaporating. So the idea is that the longer something is aged, the more of the water within the whiskey has evaporated and soaked in the flavors of the barrels that it's in. And it's a more flavorful, more concentrated whiskey. So in theory, it's a great idea. But when you're having this fluctuations in temperature that really change how fast things evaporate, or whether you're in a big barrel or a small barrel and you have more surface area, age statements really don't mean as much unless things are being produced the same. And what kind of brought this discussion up was they use smaller barrels. I think their barrels are a quarter the size of a normal standard barrel, which would lead to more surface area per ounce of whiskey, which would change what your age really means. And so that's kind of where that discussion came from. But what do we know? We're just amateur alcohol aficionados. Hey, that's for later. Sorry. They also have their Brilliant Vodka, which you had in your drink when we took our tour. Yeah, I had a super Sex in the City moment and got a Cosmo. Mm. And it was beautiful. So speaking of their cocktails... 
because that Cosmo was amazing. Their bartender, Anna, is super awesome. She made my Cosmo. Uh, also, when we went to the tasting room to just do a tasting, we were super impressed with all their spirits and we we're like, we've got to try a cocktail. So we're going to order the weirdest one on the menu. And we got the Wild East. So the Wild East had their vodka, lime, and jalapeno. It made me think of Shanghai Noon. So in addition to those two cocktails, uh, after our tour, Anna was super awesome and made us two of their cocktails that are as yet unnamed. So they just finished up a contest to figure out who could name them the best. So we, we don't have the answers for those yet. We had no idea. We, we were like, these are really good one and really good two. Yeah, we came up with nothing. Yeah. We liked them, but we didn't come up with anything. One of them had like Aperol and a lemon twist in it. And it kind of tasted like bubble gummy. Yeah. And the other one, which I really, really liked, had Thai basil and cucumber in it. And I wanted to call it the cute cuke. And then realized that no drunk person could ever order that. And I probably couldn't sober either. So I'm sure other people were going to put in better names than we would. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we did ask Derek a funny question at the end of the tour that Corey came up with. Yeah, when we went there, I was like, they have some really unique cocktails. We kind of touched on the Wild East, which is wild. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was like... Places like this, they have to be experimenting all the time and trying wild stuff. And I was like, have you ever had one that like was close, but just didn't quite make the cut or was just too weird for people? And he had a couple interesting answers. Derek has worked in the restaurant industry for a long time. So I think at least one of these was not at Lifted Spirits. But we couldn't help but mention them because it was they were so interesting. Yeah. One of them was trying to make a non-savory tomato cocktail. Basically, they were really trying to avoid being a Bloody Mary. I couldn't wrap my head around it at all. It sounds yeah. weird. I, I wanted to believe it could be a thing, but... I kept thinking of the old adage that uh, intelligence is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in fruit salad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He made it sound, too, though, like, maybe it actually wasn't that bad of a cocktail. It's just that, like, people wouldn't order it. People weren't ready. And then the other one, I believe this one was at Lifted Spirits, because I think he said the, the master was. distiller was trying to make it work, was a, a mushroom simple syrup. I mean, it sounded really intriguing. It, it's funny, because, like, I would have probably ordered both of those just to it, try them. You know us. We'll try anything. Mm -hmm. I can't guarantee it would have been good. So, now that we've rambled about Lifted Spirits a little bit, why don't yeah. we tell people where they can get it? So, they have their tasting room in the Crossroads, which is the place that we've been talking about. Cool little building. They're uh, setting up their parking space patio thing that's been really a big trend going on in downtown KC now. And then, in addition to their tasting room, they have distributors in... Kansas and Missouri, so liquor stores, bars, grocery stores, so you can probably find it near you. And you should find it near you. They also have events. The next event that's upcoming is on April 3rd, where they are doing a whiskey cocktail class. It's part of their monthly series called Stir Crazy But Not Shaken, which I just love. <laughs> It's like the most positive spin on COVID I've heard yet. Yeah. And so I think each month they'll do a different spirit and teach people how to make cocktails with those. And then you get to leave with a bottle of that spirit. Yeah. So like I said, the upcoming one is the whiskey. Uh, and I'll show you how to make a couple cocktails with it and give you a bottle to try yourself. So that's April 3rd. So go check it out. And in the meantime, I think that's all we've got. We are your local amateur alcohol aficionados. I'm Corey. I'm Roxy. And if you're drinking, you should be drinking, Casey. We'll see you next time. Hey, Kansas City drinkers. Want to see pictures of all the coolest drinkeries in town or get previews of upcoming episodes? Then make sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And if you need or just prefer captions, check out our subtitled episodes available on YouTube. It's always more fun to drink KC when we all do it together. Cheers.